Colossians chapter 2 with me. Colossians 2. We're going to take up two verses tonight, but we're going to do so in the context of what we've learned in previous weeks about Paul's agonizing concern for the believers in and around Colossae. It's an apostolic burden for which he feels responsible. He takes responsibility for the care of these people as an apostle. It's a true prison ministry, isn't it? Paul wrote these four letters from prison to Christ's church. He continued to minister in that place. And no doubt it's a compassionate protection of the flock. Remember when he talked to the elders at Ephesus in Acts, and he said, you know, you have responsibility to take care of the flock. Paul lived that. He felt very protective of the flock of God and served us well. And we also see in Paul a Christ-centered passion, both toward the life that he lived and the ministry that he was involved in. Now, there's no substitute for love for Christ. Now, there's a lot of things we can love, a lot of things we can be involved in, a lot of things we can give ourselves to. But each of us ought to be praying that we might love Christ more, that he might be fir first and foremost. Certainly that is the focus of what Paul's doing in the, in the book of Colossians. He is calling people to a passionate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Growing in knowledge would be the very knowledge that Paul writes here. It would be who Jesus is. What it means that Jesus has taken our place. What it means that we are in union with Christ. What it means that all the inheritance that is Christ as the very Son of God is also ours because we are in Christ. The reason that he reviews those things is because those are the things that he knows, if we know, will be the stabilizer for our spiritual lives. We won't be looking for something else. We won't be longing for something more. So the issue at the church of Colossae is the idea of adding something to Christ. Some imposters had risen up that uh, were teaching a genuine Christianity that had other things in addition to Christ. There are just Judaistic flavor here, which we've already seen. Uh, there's also ideas that seem to come from the culture in which they lived. We might see some of these things as spiritual shortcuts. Most of us have lived long enough to hear of those kind of things. God, okay, grab a hold of this and everything will be well. And actually, our life with Christ is a relationship with him. There's not a, a, a secret. There's not something you grab. There's no shortcut to Christ's likeness. It is actually day in and day out and taking up where we finished in heaven. I believe our capacity to worship and glorify God and magnify Christ will be in direct proportion with how we did it here. I believe we'll continue to grow throughout eternity. We will be perfect. But our capacity to praise him should be growing more and more and take us right into eternity where we'll keep doing what we have been doing. Where the more we know him, the more we can praise him. So these things were creeping in either from the inside or outside or springing up from the inside, according to Acts chapter 19. Paul's answers to magnify Christ. Paul's answers to grow in Christ, to promote Christ, to know Christ, and thus avoid the traps, avoid the substitutes. Paul says of himself in Philippians 3.10 that I might know him. And Peter says in the very last thing that he writes, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to grow in our knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John, in his first epistle, talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and talks about seeing him and, and, and communicates very much the same spirit. Listen, if you would. He said, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon the idea of gazing on him and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested. And he says, we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifest unto us that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. 
And truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And I love verse four. And these things write we unto you that your joy might be full. So you have Paul, you have Peter, you have John, and they are magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ. They walked with him. Two men walked with him in his physical uh, ministry. Uh, Paul was tutored uh, in, in a special way as a apostle born out of time. And now they have the great privilege of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 1. Colossians 2, 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you. And for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, be knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance. That's what he wants for them. The full assurance of understanding, which is the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom that is Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He seems to be taking on uh, at this point, the idea that there's greater wisdom and greater knowledge. No, it's all in Christ. It's all in hidden in Christ. He said, this I say, verse four, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Those are persuasive words that tend to convince. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ, the words of encouragement to them, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, just like you received him when you first heard the gospel, walk in him that way, walk ye in him for who he is, for how he's presented to you, for all that he's done for you, walk ye in him because in him is everything. As he just said, rooted, built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught abounding or overflowing therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you. That's the first admonition. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him that is in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that being the case, you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So your union with Christ means you're complete in him. You've already had a heart circumcision that deals with the flesh. So somebody's going to come along and, and they're going to lead you to believe you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. There's certain things you shouldn't eat. There's certain things you shouldn't do. Now, these are not things God has forbidden. They're things that are being propagated as ways to deal with the flesh. Paul says flesh has already been dealt with. Your, your potential for victory over the flesh is inside of you. It's what God has done, the spiritual surgery that is done in your heart. So don't let these Judaizers come in there and call you to be circumcised or call you to somehow get involved in these things. We're buried with him in baptism, verse number 12. Also, you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you remember this before being dead in your sins. And he uses the phrase again, the uncircumcision of your flesh. This is who you were before your heart was circumcised. Hath he quickened, he's made you alive together with him. Having forgiven you all trespasses. So somebody comes along and tries to help you understand how to deal with your sin. It's already been dealt with. How to get forgiveness. Having forgiven you all trespass. No record remains against you. So somebody comes judging you and somebody comes putting extra things on you as if somehow you need to do something more to deal with your trespass record. There is no record. God's already dealt with that. It's already been taken care of. Blotting out. How do you do that? Descriptive verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you. That, that law that condemned you. 
that law that showed all your sins, that schoolmaster that brought you to Christ, he blotted that out, which was contrary, that which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way. He canceled it. He removed it. He carried it away. He nailed it to his cross. That's what happened at Calvary. Having spoiled principalities and powers. So maybe they're coming along suggesting ways to have victory over uh, uh, the evil one or evil demons. Well, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. God, Christ has dealt with that as well. So our text, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a, the new moon or of, a, of the Sabbath days, verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body or the substance is of Christ. We noted last week that we're looking at a threefold admonition, imperatives. The first one's in verse 8. Don't be kidnapped. Don't be, don't let anybody spoil you. Don't be kidnapped by those deceived deceivers. Okay, it's not merely an issue of their teachings. It's an issue of the fact that they're trying to take you, that, that you are the prey. It's not just a teaching issue. It's, it's an issue of their threat to you as an individual. It's an issue of a threat to you as the church. So this is going gonna, gonna to damage the church, not just a matter of a, a different variant of teaching. No, this is, this is an attack. Avoid re-enslavement. Don't be kidnapped by these deceived deceivers, verse 8. And then verse 16 is the second imperative, where he says, let no man therefore judge you. And then he talks about the specifics. So don't, don't live your life under the pressure of self-appointed judges. Those who condemn you based upon manufactured, man-produced regimen or regulations. Those things they're seeking to impose on you to measure your spirituality. It's very interesting. We are uh, a, a sophisticated society. And thus, when these things show up in the church in this society, they sound a little more sophisticated than this. But I would suggest to you that we have watched throughout almost 30 years of ministry here, cycle after cycle of people coming in with something else. And it can be simply how you grow your groceries. We have seen it too many times to count. And why don't you do this? And why don't you do this? I've had the conversation, folks. And I say the same thing over and over again. Try to sell that to the believer that's on the 20th floor in Korea. You're taking me to Genesis and telling me if you dig in the dirt, you're pleasing God. I'm telling you, that doesn't stand the culture test. That doesn't stand the biblical test. But don't try to sell that that somehow is something spiritual. That is a Christ replacement. It's it. Unless you're discerning, unless you're aware, when you recognize that's all we're talking about, that's all we're hearing about, that's all we're interested in, and cycle, cycle after cycle comes through. And, and if we're not discerning, it may not sound like, you know what, you're spiritual enough, <laughs> but if you did this, you'd really be God's kind of person. No, absolutely not. A six-year-old kid trusting God has full inheritance in the Lord Jesus Christ, is circumcised to heart, has their sins forgiven, is part of the body of Christ, is part of the family of God, has a room in the Father's house, and has nothing more in this life that can ever be added to make them more spiritual or accepted with God. So stand still and don't get waylaid with it. And don't let anybody look at you and say, well, you know what? Verse number 16 of our text said, let no man do that to you. Now, in this case, uh, the Judaizers uh, seem to, because of the terminology here, seem to be trying to sell these uh, Judaistic things that were part of the Old Testament law. But they have been twisted, have they not, by the time Paul writes, by the time Jesus comes. Don't be capti captivated by this. 
philosophies, a man-crafted way of thinking, a vain deceit is empty ideas that deceive people. Tradition of men is generational errors that come back time and time again. Rudiments of the world are elementary earthbound practices. And none of them, verse number eight says, are after Christ. Let me suggest something to you tonight to keep your antennas up. I just, I, I think this will help you. I think this helps me. Everything that starts with us is bound for trouble. It starts with us. It lives with us. It ends with us. And many times when we're talking about those things, who are we talking about? Us. Biblical Christianity starts with Christ, stays with Christ, and what? Ends with Christ. Don't pick up your Bible with you at the center. Pick up your Bible and understand that God's the main character, that Christ is the central figure, and our task is to know him. Otherwise, we're going to make the scripture say something it doesn't say. We're going to force the scripture in on ourselves. Folks, we cannot start with ourselves. And these things that we're talking about that are being brought before us are the product of people starting with themselves. And it sounds, it sounds intriguing. Wow, that's kind of neat. No, if it's not Christ, it's not kind of neat. It's not. And if God's people were discerning, these things would not have any traction. We've had entire decades of seminars and things that, that lived based upon things that were not derived specifically from the scripture. And we thought, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a, and it kept life in it. The problem with it is it wasn't a magnification of Christ. You don't come away with it with a greater love for and a greater understanding of Christ. Avoid avoiding religious traps tonight. Let no man judge you, verse 16, in meat or drink. This is present active imperative, which simply tells us uh, the apostles saying, stop doing this. Evidently, this was getting some traction. He's, he's basically saying, stop letting people judge you. Now, you know, judgment like that goes two ways. Approval or disapproval. We're prone to both, aren't we? Naturally, we're prone to both. We want people to approve us. And we don't like when people what? disapprove of us. And so what, what Paul is looking at and what Paul is hearing about is that there are people who have, have, have established a position that are casting judgment on other people. You pass it or you fail it. So the judgment is two-sided. Don't listen to these critics. Paul says, stop letting others' judgments affect you. Folks, that is so fundamental that I have to say again, we are all prone to that. I sting when people disapprove of me. Don't you? Yeah, I'm not going to admit that. You don't have to admit it. I know it's true. You like people to approve of you. You like people to like you. If you watch directional shifts in people's lives, if you could get them to be honest, they're trying to get the approval of other people. That's why they're wearing what they're wearing and doing what they're doing and listening to what they're listening to. Why are they doing that? Because they want to be part of a group and they want to be what? They want to be affirmed. They want to be approved. Paul starts out here, says, don't let any man judge you. In this case, in regards to meat or in drink. Now, some would say that this is potentially a fasting issue. Others would say, and, and I would say the majority that I read would put this in the category of particular, particular foods or drinks. And then he says, or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon, these are the celebrations that the Jews were involved in, or of Sabbath days. So here's an admonition to free the believers from living under the condemning influence of these false teachers who here were resurrecting old covenant ceremonial law. So first of all tonight, avoid living your life under the pressure of self-appointed judges. And folks, sometimes they're pretty impressive people. They're pretty impressive people. They're people that are likable. 
There are people that we want to, like us, avoid living your life under the pressure of self-appointed judges. As the false notions were believed by those that had been deceived, they were busy propagating their deceptions. And folks, we live in that day as well. It doesn't take any time to propagate things in our day. It used to take a while for things to get traction. Not today. Not today. Propagating their deceptions, they were busy. They were standing in a judgment of all nonconformist. You were either approved or you were disapproved based upon what we might call manufactured standards. First of all, they claim a superior Christianity that I would suggest to you is fundamentally superficial. They claim a superior Christianity that is fundamentally superficial. He uses the word rudimentary in verse 8 and verse 20, which is very elementary, which is void of any true spiritual substance. It's earthy. It's mechanical. It's external. Let me give you one more word. It's achievable. You tell me, Mike, you will be more spiritual if you don't eat this or if you do this. I can do that. The actual appeal of it is that it's superficial enough that I can do that. I can not eat this and I can choose to eat this. I can not observe this and I can choose to observe this. They're earthly, mechanical, external and achievable, but they're empty. And at the same time, they strangely claim to be substantial and solid and God pleasing. And as we see here in other places in the New Testament, sadly, it produces a spirit of spiritual superiority. It, it produces a spirit of spiritual superiority. And that puts pressure on everyone to comply. This is the imposter's focus in life. This is the imposter's content of his or her conversation. And folks, we've watched it too many times. They're magnets. It's the measure of their spirituality. Conforming it to a particular code becomes equated with true Christianity. Traditions, movements. Here, in, in this case, with Jewish roots. Meat and drink. Food and drink. What we take into our bodies. Some kind of dietary regulation. Or a season of fasting, possibly. Avoid living your life under the pressure of self-appointed judges, Paul says. They claim a superior Christianity that is fundamentally superficial. This plastic Christianity claiming authenticity forbids certain things. Now, you're going to see later it also demands certain things. In this case, it forbids certain things, the food and drink. This plastic Christianity claiming authenticity forbids certain things, forbids certain things. Did Jesus speak to this? Mark chapter 7. If you wanted a cross-reference, you could put Matthew 15, both of these chapters. Share this testimony from the Lord, and you know it well, but it fits with what Paul is saying and helps us understand Paul is simply reemphasizing, repeating, maintaining what has been passed along to him and taught to him. Mark chapter 7, please. In verse 1, then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashing hands, what they do? They found fault. Explanation for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, which is a ceremonial washing. They eat not because they're holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold. This is the tradition of the elders as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and tables. So this was a pretty big deal. It's a pretty showy thing. All this ceremonial washing took place. They come from the market. They wash everything again. 
So, verse 5, the Pharisees and scribes ask him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? Doesn't mean dirty fingers. It means you didn't go through the ceremonial washing. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, their heart is far from me, howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines. Here's the challenge, isn't it? Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men, the tradition of the elders earlier stated. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things you do. And he said unto them, full well ye reject the commandment of God. Why? That ye may keep your own tradition. It's replaced God's commandments. For Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother. And whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, here's what you've traded out. If a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. So maybe you have responsibility to care for your family, but you've already committed this to the Lord. Verse number 12, you suffer him no more to do all for his father or his mother. You let him off with that. What that does, it makes the word of God of none effect through your tradition. Jesus is speaking very strongly about these man-made traditions, which you have delivered. And many such like things do ye. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. Listen, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he had entered into the house from the people, the disciples, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into a man, it cannot defile him because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly. Goeth out into the drought, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Now, no surprise then that Paul starts the paragraph in talking about a circumcision that's taking place where? It's at the heart. It's, it's, it's a heart issue. And so Jesus has spoken to this matter. So Christ's answer tonight is that the, the realities of the soul are the chief concern. The realities of the soul are the chief concern. Now, without suggesting to you tonight that you are buying into some, something like this, would you admit and acknowledge that we are all prone to this? We're all prone to try to look better than we are, try to sound better than we are. We're, we, we, we just... It's just in us. We haul this flesh around with us everywhere. And so we are prone to this opinion of man. Take what the Lord Jesus Christ says here. Think about it, meditate on it, pray about it, and recognize that it is actually what is within us that is the challenge. The sin corruption is internal. It's spiritual. And it's unaddressable through dietary codes. The sin corruption is internal. And it's spiritual and it's unaddressable through dietary codes. Now, young people, as they grow into adulthood, seeking to find their way, are, are going to be bombarded with these kind of things. And they're going to go back and forth. And, and they are at an impressionable age and they're trying to understand and figure things out. There's always been an element of this. If you go to Bible college, there'll be a group. If you are a homeschooler and you're part of a homeschool group, there'll be things you're going, uh-uh, I don't think so. You're going to have to, you, all of us are going to have to work through those things. But Jesus lays a fundamental principle down. 
And, and Paul lays next to that the fact that the work that God did through Christ when you were saved took place at this level. Now, why in the world would you think what you ate or what you drank could improve on that or what you don't eat or don't drink? Okay. He's not talking about sloppy living here. He's addressing what's going on with the people he's talking to. How about Paul's teachings? First Corinthians chapter nine, first Corinthians chapter nine. Just to make sure that we're not suggesting that we throw any discipline out or somehow get the wrong idea, wrong conclusion. I want to take a few of the things that Paul has said. First Corinthians nine, verse 24. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one obtaineth or receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Verse 25. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Jesus is not saying, and Paul is not saying, it doesn't care how you, it doesn't matter how you live your life. There's no suggestion here that we are not to live lives of discipline and discipleship before the Lord. So Paul's teachings, first of all, would be that personal and voluntary disciplines are good. We might even say necessary. Personal and voluntary disciplines are good. He speaks of it himself. He speaks of it to Timothy uh, in the second letter that he wrote to him. Uh, you know that chapter, chapter number two. He speaks of these disciplines. He said, if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. And then he goes right on talking about the good soldier of Christ in second Timothy chapter two. So keeping the body under as an instrument of righteousness is a good thing. Okay. Romans chapter 14, personal and voluntary disciplines are good. Romans 14 and verse 13. This is one of those exercises where you take up the pieces and parts and you lay them side by side so you don't come to a wrong conclusion. Verse number 13 of chapter 14 of Romans let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean to him, it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died, let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. So Paul's teaching also includes a consideration for others. So personal and voluntary disciplines are good and consideration for others is essential. He is not teaching in Colossians that you do whatever you want to do. and Everybody else can get over it. He's not teaching that at all. He's saying, don't find yourself in a place where men are approving or disapproving of you because of some manufactured standard that is simply rudimentary. And it came from their minds rather than from the mind of God. Personal and voluntary disciplines are good. Consideration for others is essential. And then our text in Colossians 2 and verse number 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink. <clears throat> so thirdly, superimposed compulsory regulations are to be avoided. Superimposed compulsory regulations are to be avoided. Now, there's no meanness in any of this. There's no arrogance in any of this. 
This is the heart of the beloved apostle protecting God's people. This is the apostle who recognizes that deception does happen. And he speaks to these people in very encouraging terms. He says, you guys are standing together. I hear about your faith. I hear about your love. I hear about your hope. So any of this, this brazen contemporary idea, get out of my face. I can do what I want to do. Did not come from the Bible. The grace uh, explosion thing stated succinctly many years ago, who would have known that it made its way into fundamentalism? Don't let anybody tell you what to do. The grace awakening. Don't let anybody tell. As soon as I heard that, I said, oh, even God. And I listened further and recognized that was a reaction. That was a reaction to legalistic, militant, whatever. It wasn't the Bible. So it, ma- it does matter how I live. It matters how I choose to spend my hours. It matters how I live if it impacts the way you live. And if there's something that troubles you, Paul said, that's an easy one for me. I'll never eat any of it again. That's a problem. So take the whole of the scripture. Let it settle in on your heart. Take the spirit of the scripture and recognize there's no meanness here. There's grace. But there's also grit. I'm not going to live trying to be approved or disapproved by people who come up with ideas, false ideas about superiority spiritually. I'm not going to live trying to please them. I'm not going to buy into that because to do that is to depreciate Christ. And as graciously as you and I can say it, we have to say, you know what? We are complete, use the Bible, we are complete in him. And when we're enjoying that completion in him, then those things don't interest us. They don't interest us. But they don't not interest us because we're undisciplined and we don't care and we live like we want to. They disinterest us because we have Christ. And so we are not willing to re-enslave ourselves. Plastic Christianity, it claims authenticity that forbids certain things. Secondly, there's this surfacey Christianity in its appeal demands this, this surfacey Christianity in its appeal demands certain things. So first of all, it, it, it doesn't allow certain things. It forbids certain things. And now secondly, it demands certain things. Okay. And in this case, in respect to a holy day, a new moon, a Sabbath day, these requirements are sourced in the old covenant. There are ceremonial guidelines for the Jews under the old covenant, but those things have been stretched upon and manipulated, as Jesus pointed out in Mark. They're not the creation moral commandments of God. They're festivals, they're new moons, they're Sabbaths. These were annual things, monthly things, weekly things. And folks, they were glorious things. I was reading through that section a couple of weeks ago. Boy, they had a time on those feast days, didn't they? I thought about that when we were listening to the prelude and getting ready to sing tonight. Those, those people sang with all their heart. When they had times of rejoicing, they um, he told them, just, just, Nehemiah said, just enjoy it. <laughs> the joy of the Lord is your strength. Stop, stop. Okay, we've been 70 years out of Jerusalem and finally we're going home. You folks are so overwhelmed, you're weeping. Okay, how about we feast? How about we sing? Uh, in in the the kings were saying, get out the trumpets, get out the cymbals. It's time to make music to the Lord. So these were not, you know, Old Testament stuff bothers me. I would have loved to have been part of one of those festivals. I'd have loved to have been hiking up toward Jerusalem with y'all and talking about, well, isn't this an amazing week? Why? Because it was all God. God did that. God wanted that. God wasn't done with that. God was, that was a foreshadowing of Christ. But it was a glorious thing. The problem is when it gets twisted. It never has been, was intended as a means of salvation. It was a schoolmaster to what? To Christ. It was to be obeyed. But then the 400 silent years between the Old and New Testament, the Pharisees sprang up and, and, and they were the separatists and they just kept 
working on that and working on that and working on that, and they bought volume after volume after volume. So by the time Jesus steps on the scene, it's almost like he's saying, that Old Testament stuff, forget that. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the manipulation of the Old Testament. He's talking about what they had done with the Old Testament, just as illustrated in our text from Mark. The surfacey Christianity in its appeal demands certain things. Holy days, new moons, okay? These are uh, calendar things, annual, monthly, weekly celebrations required of Israel as they recognized the lordship of Jehovah over the whole circle of life. They were purposeful. The sacrifices and the ceremonies and the worship was all intended to magnify God in his creatorship, his lordship, his saviorship. All of it anticipated a fulfillment in the Messiah's work. There were types, there were pictures, there were vivid activities. And they were heaven sanctioned approaches to God that anticipated a future mediator. And Chad's been reading through Hebrews with us on Sunday morning. That's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is trying to help them see. Those were foreshadowing this. There were priests and there were certain places and there were certain procedures. There were particulars, there were promises, and all of that magnified the coming work of the Messiah. Christ's answer, first of all, is that all is fulfilled in me. All is fulfilled in me. What did he say when they challenged him about eating, having his disciples eat uh, the corn on, on the Sabbath. Uh, what did he say to them? He said, uh, the son of the man is the Lord of the Sabbath, didn't he? <laughs> the Lord of the Sabbath. He wasn't disregarding again anything God had given. Matthew 12, Luke chapter 6. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, not the Pharisees, not the religious leaders who had actually added to God's law. Secondly, Christ's answer was it all anticipates an internal cleansing. It all anticipates an internal cleansing or magnifies that or typifies that. Look at it in uh, Luke chapter 11 briefly, please. It's a long section, so we'll not read the whole thing, but it's another one of those sections where Jesus takes on the Pharisees. And I think it's most appropriate to lay beside what Paul's saying in these two verses because it's the same kind of things. We we'll read a few of these verses beginning in verse 37 of Luke chapter 11. All anticipates an internal, these ceremonial cleansings. Verse 37, as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. You're thinking, here we go again. The Lord said unto him, now, do you Pharisees may clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. <laughs> you fools. Did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? And then he breaks into these patterns. Rather give alms of such things as you have and behold, all things are clean unto you. Woe unto you, Pharisees. And he just goes over and over and over. Woe unto you, woe unto you, woe unto you. What is he communicating? What is he confronting? He's confronting all this externalism. He said, that's not what it's about. You're actually living in disobedience to the Lord. You're, you're, and then occupying those utmost seats you're, you're in, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. You're praying at a particular place at a particular time to make sure that people can see you. You really are whitewashed sepulchers. Christ answers that all is fulfilled in him and all anticipates an internal cleansing. And I'm taking from Matthew 5 through 7 this third reminder and that all is twisted by what I would like to call tonight religious hucksters. They're religious hucksters. And if you'll go back in your time and read the Sermon on the Mount, you will see Jesus step by step taking on those religious hucksters. They had those people under their thumb. They had those people seeing God as anything but the God that he is presented to be. You say this, Jesus said, I say this. This is how you're thinking. This is what the truth is. So for three chapters, Jesus is untangling 
all that has been twisted by these religious hucksters. They made it a means of saving grace. They made it a mere, meritorious means of favor with God. They made it a measurement of spirituality, their prayer, their alms, their fasting, all a show, all a show. You say, boy, those sound <clears throat> like such strong words from Jesus. They are. They are strong words from Jesus. And maybe, maybe as a side note tonight, uh, could I ask you as an American Christian, sophisticated, how would you do if Jesus spoke to you like that? How would you do if anybody else loved you enough to speak truth straightforward? You say, whoa, 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 we don't do that, right? The 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice. Okay, just food for thought. This is the incarnate son of God. He didn't even wait for them to talk about the unwashed hands. He got right where they were. You know what he did? His word was a dissector of the thoughts and intents of their hearts. Does that give us license to irritate people and go off crazy? It does not. I just ask you again, how would you do if Jesus spoke to you like that? Because we claim to be Jesus people. We claim to be willing to listen to Jesus. He spoke very straightforwardly and very hard against Pharisees. He, st he spoke very strongly against those that twisted his word, his father's word, God's word to fit their own plan. Happening every day in our culture, happening every Sunday in our culture, men stand in this place and take the word of God and twist it to make it say what they want to hear and what they know the people want to hear. Jesus, if he was on the planet today, would go after it the same way. He'd cleanse the temple. He let it be known. That's not the father's plan. And he, perfect son of God, certainly stood in the place to do that. But I just, it's just culture shock for us, isn't it? You read over those sections in Paul. That certainly was wrong, wasn't it? He called names. He, he spoke some names of some people in those churches. They read those things. Can you imagine? The person standing up and reading, they start reading and that person sitting to your right and Paul starts naming names. Why? Because the cause of Christ mattered more, mattered most. They were willing to speak the truth and call out those. Paul wrote name after name. This guy was not a buddy of mine. This guy was not a help to me. This guy deserted me. This guy hurt me. This guy ran against the cause of Christ. So in our efforts to be kind, and we should be kind, and compassionate, we should be compassionate, and loving, and we should be loving, we can't define that in terms different than the testimony of our Lord or of Paul. We can't do it. And one of the hardest things to do as a pastor is to figure out how to speak truth to people, and you know they don't want to hear it. But you know it's what they need to hear. But you know, if they hear it and don't want to hear it, they can go somewhere else and hear somebody else. That's the joy of pastoral ministry in the United States of America in 2022. It's truth. It's truth. I'm not asking license. I'm not excusing anything. I'm simply saying, if we're going to be Bible people, let's be Bible people and recognize that Jesus did no ear tickling. Paul did no ear tickling. He spoke the truth because he knew that's what they needed to hear. And the people that are going to help us are the people that are able to speak the truth into our lives. And we have to be helped by being willing to hear that truth. We've got to finish up here. Christ's teachings. Now, Paul's teachings. These requirements potentially assault the gospel. This is... The crux of the matter for Paul, isn't it? Verse number 17, Colossians 2 and verse number 17. After he talks about the don't let them 
judge you, meet, drink, respect a holy day, new moon, Sabbath days. Then he says this, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. Now in Galatians, it was another gospel, wasn't it? These requirements potentially assault the gospel. Here, what is at stake from what Paul is talking about is an embracing of the shadow instead of the substance. This word body that's translated body here before us is a difficult word. It's unclear actually in classical Greek as to what its, its core meaning is. It has a variety of uses in the New Testament. The bottom line, it means the substance of something. The reality of something. So you could think of it in the Hebrews way when, when the book of Hebrews, it's the shadow versus the substance. It's, it's the reality. It's, it's the person, right? Actuality. It's the whole being. It's not the shadow, but it's the substance. The, sh the body is the substance of man giving expression to the soul of man. The shadow is that unsubstantial part of man. The book of Hebrews takes that word shadow and uses it in terms of Old Testament ceremony, ritual, priesthood, sacrifices, those things that are to come. And then the substance is Christ being the fulfillment of all that. He's the ultimate reality of all the what? All the pictures. So it's not that the shadow served no purpose. It's rather that the purpose has been served. It's not the shadow and substance are contrary to one another. Everything that pointed to Christ is contrary to Christ. No, everything that pointed to Christ is fulfilled in Christ. We got the substance. We don't do shadow anymore. We don't do, this is not Heritage Baptist Temple. We don't do sacrifices here anymore. We don't do washings here. That's what they did in the temple. We are a church. We're a group of New Testament believers. So it's not that the shadow wasn't God ordained and wasn't good. It's that the shadows fulfilled in the substance of Jesus Christ. And the whole book of Hebrews argues that. So the substance is here. Stop, right? Stop dealing with the shadow. Stop, stop. Well, that's what's happening here. These holy days, these things to eat, these things to drink. So the claim of the imposters is that they're going to fill up something that's lacking. A deeper knowledge, a higher spiritual plane, a fresh experience, new insights. Paul's answer to that in verse 17 is that you're reverting back to the shadow when the substance is already here. One writer says, if you are still, if you're still trying to fill out people's spiritual experience, then you are living as though Christ has not yet come. See, it's an assault on the gospel. If you're still trying to fill out people's spiritual experience, then you are living as though Christ has not yet come. So it is you actually with your claims to be superior who are still living in the shadows. See, Paul, a masterful communicator as guided by the Holy Spirit, he turns that whole thing back around and says, you know, these people that are springing up, that are trying to make you think they're superior, substantial, they're actually living in the shadows. You have Christ. You don't need any of that. This thing has been turned completely around. So it is you, that is the imposters, with your claims to be superior who are still living in the shadows. So these additions, these additions leave us living in the shadows and missing out on the substance. These additions leave us living in the shadows and missing out on the substance. In our own day, there are various extra biblical focal points that seek to replace Jesus Christ. Issues that are propounded to be universal and spiritual. Really man's ideas that have gone to seed that are rooted in the physical, the tangible, the earthy. They will prove deceptive, they will be convincing, they will be persuasive, they will be attractive, and yet they are still without substance, and they are still superficial rather than spiritual. And the people who buy into these do not want to hear that. And sometimes you have to say, that is not true. What you just said is simply not true. And the response to that is not warm and fuzzy because they have built their whole life around that. 
It is their identity. It is who they are. And you say, if Christ is not who you are, then you are not who Christ saved you to be. It doesn't matter how exciting it is. It's still shadow stuff. It's still substanceless. Folks, let's be aware. Let's be alert. Let's be disinterest, a decided disinterest in anything that threatens to replace Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. <laughs> thank you for the privilege of meeting with these folks tonight. And these things, Father, are not necessarily easy because some of us have been around these kind of things, maybe even drawn into these kind of things or had a high regard for these kind of things where man's ideas are spun off as biblical truth. Yet, Father, they won't stand the test of the scriptures. They won't stand the test of a counterculture application. They won't stand the test of history, your history, the history of the scriptures, what you've written, what you've given to us. But Father, the greatest impact of this from what we're hearing from Paul is that they're all replacements to Christ. We do want a greater understanding, but we have learned that that is by understanding more of Christ. We do want a growing knowledge, but that knowledge has to be of Christ. And no doubt more of these things will come around. Maybe even tonight there are people here who are thinking, you know what? I'm spending a lot more time thinking about this and this and this and this than I am about Christ. I have made this and this and this of supreme importance to me. Things that God really doesn't care about. He isn't concerned. He certainly doesn't want to replace Christ. We're prone to these things. We're weak. We're sheep-like. And we're asking for your help. I pray that you give us understanding with each other. And Father, we'd have the same spirit that Paul had as he wrote this letter. We'd understand the strength of Jesus being an indicator of how bad this was and what an impact it had made on an entire people in the Jewish culture in which Jesus was born. You gave up your son to deliver us from these things. And I pray, Father, that we would meditate on these things and flesh them out in tangible ways. I pray that our men would lead their families. They would step back from strong opinions about things that have nothing to do with Christ. Release their grip on those things that they have become so convinced of and ask themselves the question as to whether they love you with their whole heart. Father, that convicts me to my core. We pray that you'd work among your people here and work through us. And change us, conform us to the image of Christ. Humble us. Cause us not to think so highly of ourselves. And Father, help us not to care so much about the opinions of other people. For many are capitulating. Because man's opinion is dominating their lives. They can't stand the criticism. They can't stand the hardship. We understand. We pray that we would stand as the Colossians were standing at the time they received this letter. Standing firm, rooted deep. May we grow in Christ in the remainder of this week. And would you bring us back together and allow us another Lord's Day of worshiping you, learning more of you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.